Chapter Two of Moving the Mountain by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The day after tomorrow, I was to see it the day after tomorrow. This strange, new, abhorrent world. The more I considered what bits of information I had gleaned already, the more I disliked what lay before me. In the first blazing light of returned memory and knowledge, the first joy of meeting my sister, the hope of seeing home again, I had not distinguished very sharply between what was new to my bewildered condition and what was new indeed, new to the world as well as to me. But now a queer feeling of disproportion and unreality began to haunt me. As my head cleared, and such knowledge as I was now gathering began to help towards some sense of perspective and relation, even my immediate surroundings began to assume a sinister importance. Any change to any person is something of a shock, though sometimes a beneficial one. Changes too sudden and too great are hard to bear for any one. But who can understand the peculiar horror of my unparalleled experience? Slowly the thing took shape in my mind. There was the first irrevocable loss. My life. Thirty years. The thirty years in which a man may really live. These were gone from me forever. I was coming back, strong to be sure, well enough in health, even, I hoped, with my old mental vigor. But not to the same world. Even the convict who survives thirty years' imprisonment may return at length to the same kind of world he had left so long. But I! It was as if I had slept, and in my sleep they had stolen my world. I threw off the thought and started into action. Here was a small world, the big steamer beneath me. I had already learned much about her. In the first place, she was not a steamer, but a thing for which I had no name. Her power was electric. Oh, well, I thought as I examined her machinery. This I might have expected. Thirty years of such advances as we were making in 1910 were sure to develop electric motors of all sorts. The engineer was a pleasant, gentlemanly fellow, more than willing to talk about his profession and its marvelous advances. The ship was well manned, certainly. Though the work required was far less than it used to be, the crew were about as numerous. I had made some acquaintances among the ship's officers, even among the men, who were astonishingly civil and well-mannered, but I had not at first noticed the many points of novelty in their attitude, or in my surroundings. Now I paced the deck and considered the facts I had observed, the perfect ventilation of the vessel, the absence of the smell of cooking and of bilge-water, the dainty convenience and appropriate beauty of all the fittings and furnishings, the smooth speed and steadiness of her. The quarters of the crew I found as remarkable as anything else about the vessel. Indeed, the forecastle and steerage differed more from what I remembered than from any other part. Every person on board had a clean and comfortable lodging, though there were grades of distinction in size and decoration. But any gentleman could have lived in that forecastle without discomfort. Indeed, I soon found that many gentlemen did. I discovered, quite by accident, that one of the crew was a Harvard man. He was not at all loath to talk of it, either was evidently no black sheep of any sort. Why had he chosen this work? Oh, he wanted the experience. It widened life, knowing different trades. Why was he not an officer, then? He didn't care to work at it long enough. This was only experience work, you see. I did not see, nor ask, but I inferred, and it gave me again that feeling as if the ground underfoot had wiggled slightly. Was that old dream of Bellamy stalking abroad? Were young men portioned out to menial service willy-nilly? It was evidently not a universal custom, for some of the sailors were much older men, and long used to the business. I got hold of one who seemed more like the deckhands of old days, though cleaner and more cheerful, a man who was all of sixty. Yes, he had followed the sea from boyhood. Yes, he liked it, had always liked it, liked it better now than when he was young. Had he seen many changes? I listened carefully, though I asked the question lightly enough. Changes? He guessed he had. Tobacco was better for one thing. I was relieved to see that men still smoked, 
and then the jar came again as I remembered that, save for this man and one elderly officer, I had not seen any one smoking on the vessel. "'How do you account for it?' I asked the old Yankee, for tobacco's being better. He grinned cheerfully. "'Less run on it, I guess,' said he. "'Young fellers don't seem to smoke no more, and I ain't seen nobody chewing for, well, for ten years back.' is it cheaper as well as better no sir it ain't it's perishing high but then wages is high too he grudgingly admitted better tobacco and better wages anything else improved yes siree grubs better by square miles and accommodations and clothes make better stuff now well well said i as genially as i knew how that's very different from my young days then everybody older than I always complained about all manner of things, and told how much better and cheaper things were when they were young. Yes, twas so, he admitted meditatively. But tain't so now. Shoes is better. Most things is better, I guess. Seems like water runnin' up hill, don't it, sir? It did. I didn't like it. I got away from the old man and walked by myself, like Kipling's cat. Of course, of course, I said to myself impatiently, I may as well expect to find everything as much improved from what it was in my time as in, say, sixty years before. That sort of progress goes faster and faster. Things change, but people. And here is where I got this creepy sense of unreality. At first everything was so strange to me, and my sister was so kind and thoughtful, so exquisitely considerate of my feelings and condition that I had failed to notice this remarkable circumstance. So were the other people. It was like being in a, well, in a house-party of very nice persons. Kind, cheerful, polite. Here I suddenly realized that I had not seen a grouchy face, heard an unkind remark, felt, as one does feel through silk and broadcloth, the sense of discontent and disapproval. There was one, the somewhat hard-faced old lady, Mrs. Talbot, of whom I had hopes. I sought her, and laid myself out to please her by those little attentions which are so grateful to an elderly woman from a young man. Her accepting these as a commonplace, her somewhat too specific inquiries about my health, suddenly reminded me that I was not a young man. She talked on while I made again that effort at readjustment which was so hideously hard. Gone in a night, all my young manhood, gone untasted. "'Do you find it difficult to concentrate your attention?' she was saying, a steely eye fixed upon my face. "'I beg your pardon, madam, I fear I do. You were saying—' "'I was saying that you will find many changes when you get back.' "'I find them already, Mrs. Talbot. They rather loom up. It is sudden, you see. "'Yes, you've been away a long time, I understand. In the Far East?' Mrs. Talbot was the first person who had asked me a question. Evidently hers were the manners of an older generation, and for once I had to admit that the younger generation had improved. But I recalled the old defensive armor against the old assaults. "'Quite a while,' I answered cheerfully. "'Quite a while. Now, what should you think would impress me most, in the way of change?' "'The women,' she answered promptly. I smiled my gallantest and replied, bowing. I find them still charming. Her set face broke into a pleased smile. You do my heart good, she cried. I haven't heard a compliment in fifteen years. Good heavens, madam, what are our men thinking of? It's not the men's fault, it's the women's. They won't have it. Are there many of these new women? There's nothing else, except a few old ones like me. I hastened to assure her that a woman like her would never be called old, and she looked as pleased as a girl. Presently I excused myself and left her with relief. It was annoying to have the only specimen of the kind of woman I used to like turn out to be personally the kind I never liked. On the opposite deck I found Miss Elwell, and for once alone. A retiring back, wearing an aggrieved expression, showed that it had not been for long. "'May I join you, Miss Elwell?' I might. But I did. We paced up and down, silent for a bit. She was a joy to the eye, a lovely, straight young thing, 
with a fresh, pure color and eyes of dancing brightness. I spoke of this and that aboard ship, the sea, the weather, and she was so gaily friendly, so sweet and modest, yet wholly frank, that I grew quite happy in her company. My sister must have been mistaken about her being a civil engineer. She might be a college girl, but nothing worse. And she was so pretty. I devoted myself to Miss Elwell till she took herself off, probably to join her... her... and it occurred to me that I had seen no one with Miss Elwell. Nellie, said I, for heaven's sake, give me the straight of all this. I'm going distracted with the confusion. What has happened to the world? Tell me all I can bear it, as the extinct novels used to say. But I cannot bear this terrible suspense. Don't you have novels any more? Novels? Oh, yes, plenty. Better than ever were written. You'll find it splendidly worth while to read quite a few of them when you're getting oriented. Well, you want a kind of running historic sketch? Yes, give me the outlines, just the heads, as it were. You see, my dear, it is not easy to get readjusted even to the old things, and there are so many new ones. We were in our steamer chairs, most people dozing after their midday meal. She reached over and took my hand in hers, and held it tight. It was marvelously comfortable, this one live visible link between what was forever past and this uncertain future. But for her, even those old, old days might have flickered and seemed doubtful, I should have felt like one swimming under water and not knowing which way was up. She gave me solid ground underfoot at any rate. Whatever her place might be in this new world, she had talked to me only of the old one. In these long, quiet, restful days, she had revived in my mind the pleasant memories of our childhood together, our little southern home, our patient, restrained northern mother, and the fine education she gave her schoolless little ones, our high-minded, and alas, narrow-minded father, handsome, courteous, inflexible. Under Nellie's gentle leading, my long unused memory cells had revived like rain-washed leaves, and my past life had at last grown clear and steady. My college life, my old chum, Granger, who had visited us once, our neighbors and relations, little gold-haired cousin Drusilla, whom I in ten years' proud seniority had teased as a baby, played with and tyrannized over as a confiding child, and kissed good-bye, a slim, startled little figure, when I left for Asia. Nellie had always spoken of things as I remembered them, and avoided adroitly, or quietly refused to discuss, their new aspects. I think she was right, at first. "'Out with it,' said I. "'Come, have we adopted socialism?' I braced myself for the answer. Socialism? Oh, why, yes, I think we did, but that was twenty years ago. And it didn't last? You've proved the impracticable folly of it? You've discarded it? I sat up straight, very eager. Why, no, said Nellie. It's very hard to put these new things into old words. We've got beyond it. Beyond socialism? Not, not anarchy? Oh, bless you, no, no, indeed. We understand better what socialism meant, that's all. We have more, much more than it ever asked. But we don't call it that. I did not understand. It's like this, she said. Suppose you had left a friend in the throes of a long, tempestuous courtship, full of ardor, of keen joy, and keener anticipation. Then, returning, you say to your friend, do you still have courtship? And he says, why, no, I'm married. It's not that he has discarded it, proved its impracticable folly. He had to have it, he liked it, but he's got beyond it. Go on and elucidate, I said. I don't quite follow your parable. She considered a bit. Well, here's a more direct parallel. Back in the eighteenth century the world was wild about democracy. Democracy was going to do all things for all men. Then, with prodigious struggles, they acquired some democracy, set it going. It was a good thing, but it took time. It grew. It had difficulties. In the next century there was less talk about all the heavenly results of democracy and more definite efforts to make it work. This was clearer. You mean... I followed her slowly. 
that what was called socialism was attained, and you've been improving upon it. Exactly, brother. You are on, as we used to say. But even that's not the main step. No. What else? Only a new religion. I showed my disappointment. Nellie watched my face silently. She laughed. She even kissed me. John, said she, I could make vast sums by exhibiting you to psychologists. As an extinct species of mind, you draw better than a woolly mammoth. I smiled wryly, and she squeezed my hand. Might as well make a joke of it, old man. You've got to get used to it, and the sooner the quicker. All right, go ahead with your new religion. She sat back in her chair with an expression of amused retrospection. I had forgotten, she said. I had really forgotten. We didn't used to think much of religion, did we? Father did, said I. No, not even father and his kind. They only used it as a— what was the old joke? A patent fire escape. Nobody appreciated religion. They spent much time and money on it, I suggested. That's not appreciation. Well, come on with the story. Did you have another incarnation of anybody? You might call it that, Nellie allowed, her voice growing quietly earnest. We certainly had somebody with an unmistakable power. This did not interest me at all. I hated to see Nellie looking so sweetly solemn over her new religion. In the not unnatural reaction of a minister's son, rigidly reared, I had had small use for religion of any sort. As a scholar I had studied them all and felt as little reverence for the ancient ones as for the shifty mushroom crop of new sects and schools of thought with which the country teemed in my time. "'Now look here, John,' said she at length. "'I've been watching you pretty closely.' and I think you're equal to a considerable mental effort. In one way it may be easy for you, just because you've not seen a bit of it. Anyhow, you've got to face it. Our world has changed in these thirty years, more than the change between what it used to be and what people used to imagine about heaven. Here is the first thing you've got to do, mentally. You must understand, clearly, in your human consciousness, that the objection and distaste you feel is only in your personal consciousness. Everything is better. There is far more comfort, pleasure, peace of mind, a richer, swifter growth, a higher, happier life in every way. And yet you won't like it, because you're— She seemed to hesitate for a word now and then, as one trying to translate. Reactions are all tuned to earlier conditions. If you can understand this and see over your own personal attitudes, it will not be long before a real convincing sense of joy, of life, will follow the intellectual perception that things are better. Hold on, I said. Let me chew on that a little. As if, I presently suggested, as if I'd left a home that was poor and dirty and crowded, with a pair of quarrelsome, inefficient parents, drunken and abusive, maybe, and a lot of horrid, wrangling, selfish little brothers and sisters, and woke up one fine morning in a great, clean, beautiful house, richly furnished, full of a lot of angels, who were total strangers. Exactly, she cried. Hurrah for you, Johnny, you couldn't have divined it better. I don't like it, said I. I'd rather have my old home and my own family than all my princely palaces and amiable angels you could dream of in a hundred years. Mother had an old storybook by a New England author, Nellie quietly remarked, where somebody said, you can't always have your druthers. She used to quote it to me when I was little and complained that things were not as I wanted them. John, dear, please remember that the new people in the new world find it like home, and love it far better than we used to. It'll be queer to you, but it's a pleasant commonplace to them. We have found out at last that it is natural to be happy. She was silent, and I was silent, till I asked her, What's the name of your new religion? It hasn't any, she answered. Hasn't any? What do they call it? The believers, I mean. They call it living and life. That's all. Hm. And what's their specialty? Nellie gave a funny little laugh, part sad, part tender, part amused. I had no idea it would be so hard to tell you things, she said. You'll have to just see for yourself, I guess. Do go on, Nellie. I'll be good. You were going to tell me in a nutshell what had happened. 
please do the thing that has happened said she slowly is just this the world has come alive we are doing in a pleasant practical way all the things which we could have done at any time before only we never thought so the real change is this we have changed our minds this happened very soon after you left oh that was a time to think that you should have missed it she gave my hand another sympathetic squeeze and went on after that it was only a question of time of how soon we could do things and we've been doing them ever since faster and faster this seemed rather flat and disappointing i don't see that you make out anything wonderful so far a new religion which seems to consist only in behaving better and a gradual improvement of social conditions all that was going on when i left nelly regarded me with a considering eye i see how you interpret it she said behaving better in our early days was a small personal affair either a pathetically inadequate failure to do what one could not or a pharisaic self-righteous success in doing what one could all personal personal good behavior has to be a personal affair hasn't it i mildly protested not by any means said nelly with decision that was precisely what kept us so small and bad so miserably confined and discouraged like a lot of well-meaning soldiers imagining that their evolutions were a personal affair or an orchestra plaintively protesting that if each man played a correct tune of his own choosing the result would be perfect dear dear no sir she continued with some fierceness that's just where we changed our minds humanity has come alive i tell you and we have reason to be proud of our race she held her head high there was a glad triumphant look in her eyes not in the least religious said she you'll see results that will make it clearer to you than anything i can say but if i may remark that we have no longer the fear of death much less of damnation and no such thing as sin that the only kind of prison left is called a quarantine that punishment is unknown but preventive means are of drastic and sweeping nature such as we never dared to think of before that there is no such thing in the civilized world as poverty no labor problem no color problem no sex problem almost no disease very little accident practically no fires that the world is rapidly being reforested the soil improved the output growing in quantity and quality that no one needs to work over two hours a day and most people work four that we have no graft no adulteration of goods no malpractice no crime nelly said i you are a woman and my sister i'm very sorry but i don't believe it i thought you wouldn't said she women always will have the last word end of chapter two moving the mountain by charlotte perkins gilman this librivox recording is in the public domain the blue shoreline of one's own land always brings a thrill of the heart to me buried exile as i had been the heart leap was choking ours was a slow steamer and we did not stop at montauk where the mail and swiftest travelers landed nor in jamaica harbor with the immigrants as we swept along the sunny level spaces of the south shore nelly told me how long island was now the reception room of our country instead of poor brutal little ellis island the shores are still mostly summer places she said one of the most convincing of our early lines of advance was started on the south shore and there are plenty of country clubs home parks and things like that but the bulk of the island toward the western end is an experiment station in applied sociology i was watching the bright shore hungrily with a glass i could see many large buildings not too closely set i should think it would spoil the place for homes i said nelly had a way of listening to my remarks kindly and pleasantly but as if i were somehow a long way off and she was trying to grasp what i said in a way it did at first she explained presently but even then it meant just as many homes for other people and now it means so much more 
she hesitated a moment and then plunged in resolutely you're in for a steady course of instructive remarks from now on everybody will be explaining things and bragging about them we haven't outgrown some of the smaller vices you see as to this immigration problem we woke up to this fact among others that the reintegration of peoples as ward called it was a sociological process not possible to stop but quite possible to assist and to guide to great advantage and here in america we recognized our own special place the melting pot you know yes i remembered the phrase i never liked it our family were pure english stock and rightly proud of their descent i begin to see my dear sister that while receiving the torrent of instructive remarks you foretell the way of wisdom for me is steadfastly to withhold my own opinions nelly laughed appreciatively you always had a long head john well whether you like it or not our people saw their place and power at last and rose to it we refuse no one we have discovered as many ways of utilizing human waste as we used to have for the waste products of coal tar you don't mean to say idiots and criminals i protested idiots hopeless ones we don't keep any more she answered gently they are very rare now the grade of average humanity is steadily rising and we have the proud satisfaction of knowing we have helped it rise we organized a permanent reception committee for the whole country one station here and one in california anybody could come but they had to submit to our handling when they did come we used to have a physical examination didn't we a rudimentary one what we have now is compulsory socialization i stared at her yes i know you were thinking of that geological kind of evolution people used to talk about and you can't alter human nature in the first place we can in the second place we do in the third place there isn't so much alteration needed as we used to think human nature is a pretty good thing no immigrant is turned loose on the community till he or she is up to a certain standard and the children we educate we always did didn't we always did my brother we didn't know what the word meant in your time i shall be glad to follow that up i assured her education was improving even in the old days i remember i shall be glad to see the schools some of them you won't know when you do see them said nelly on long island we have an agricultural and industrial station like like i think we had something like it in some of our western colleges which it was the fashion to look down upon we have a graded series of dwellings where the use of modern conveniences is taught to all newcomers suppose they won't learn they used to prefer to live like hogs as i remember again nelly looked at me as if i were speaking to her from a distance we used to say so and i suppose we used to think so some of us but we know better now these people are not compelled to come to our country but if they come they know what they have to do and they do it you may have noticed that we have no steerage i had noticed it they have decent surroundings from the first step they have to be antiseptically clean they and all their belongings before entering the ship but what an awful expense i ventured suppose you keep cattle john and knew how to fatten and improve them and suppose your ranch was surrounded by strays mavericks anxious to come in would you call it an expense to add to your herd you can't sell people no but you can profit by their labor that sounds like the same old game i should think your socialism would have put an end to that socialism did not alter the fact that wealth comes by labor she replied all these people work we provide the opportunity for them we train them to higher efficiency especially the children the very best and wisest of us are proud to serve there as women used to be proud when they were invited to help receive some personage we receive humanity and introduce it to america what they produce is used to cover the expense of their training and also to lay up a surplus for themselves they must produce more than they used to observed i dryly they do said nelly you might as well finish this thing up i said then when people talk to me about emigration i can look intelligent and say i know about that and really i'm interested how do you begin with them well when they come into jamaica harbor they see a great crescent of white piers each with its gate we'll go and see it some day 
splendid arches with figures on them, like the ones they used to put up for triumphs. There's the German gate, and the Spanish gate, the English gate, the Italian gate, and so on. There is welcome in their own language, and instruction in ours. There is physical examination, the most searching and thorough, microscopic, chemical. They have to come up to a certain standard before they are graduated, you see. Graduated? Yes, we have a standard of citizenship now, an idea of what people ought to be and how to make them so. Dear me, to think that you don't know about that. I shouldn't think they'd stand for it, all this examination and so on. No country on earth offers so much happiness to its people. Nowhere else, yet, is there as good opportunity to be helped up, to have real scientific care, real loving study and assistance. Everybody likes to be made the most of. Everybody, nearly, has the feeling that they might be something better if they had a chance. We give them the chance. Then I should think you'd have all the creation on your hands at once. And depopulate the other nations. They had something to say about that. You see, this worked all sorts of ways. In the first place, when we got all the worst and lowest people, that left an average of better ones at home, people who could learn more quickly. When we proved what good stuff human nature was, rightly treated, they all took heart of grace and began to improve their own. Then, as our superior attraction steadily drew off the lower classes, that raised the value of those who remained. They were better paid, better thought of at home. As more and more people came to us, the other nations got rather alarmed, and began to establish counter-attractions, to keep their folks at home. Also, many other nations had some better things than we did, you remember, and finally most people love their own country better than any other, no matter how good. No, the balance of population is not seriously altered. Still, with such an influx of low-grade people, you must have a Malthusian torrent of increasing population on your hands. Again that odd listening look, her head a little on one side. "'I have to keep remembering,' she said. "'Have to recall what people wrote and said and thought in the past generation. The idea was that people had to increase like rabbits, and would eat up the food supply, so wars and pestilences and all manner of cruel conditions were necessary to keep down the population. Wasn't that it?' "'You are twenty years out, my dear,' I rejoiced to assure her. We had largely passed that, and were beginning to worry about the decreasing birth-rate, among the more intelligent. It was only the lowest grade that kept on like rabbits, as you say. But it's that sort you seem to have been filling in with. I should think it would have materially lowered the average. Or have you, in this new forcing system, made decent people out of scrubs? That's exactly what we've done. We've improved the people and lowered the birth-rate at one stroke. They were beginning to talk eugenics when I left. This is not eugenics. We have made great advances in that, of course, but the chief factor in this change is a common biological law. Individuation is in inverse proportion to reproduction, you know. We individualize the women, develop their personal power, their human characteristics, and they don't have so many children. I don't see how that helps unless you have eliminated the brutality of men. My dear brother, the brutality of men lowered the birth rate. It didn't raise it. One of those undifferentiated peasant women would have a baby every year if she was married to a saint, and she couldn't have more in polyandry, unless it were twins. No, the birth rate was for women to settle, and they have. Out of fashion to have children at all? No, John, you needn't sneer. We have better children than ever were born on earth before, and they grade higher every year. But we are approaching a balanced population. I didn't like the subject and turned to the clear skyline of the distant city. It towered as of old, but seemed not so close-packed. Not one black cloud, and very few white ones. You've ended the smoke nuisance, I'm glad to see. Has steam gone too? We use electricity altogether in all the cities now, she said. It occurred to us that to pipe a leaking death into every bedroom, to thread the city with poison, fire, and explosion was foolish. Defective wiring used to cause both death and conflagration, didn't it? It did, she admitted, but it is not defective any more. Is the coal all gone? No, but we burn it at the mines, by a process which does not waste ninety per cent of the energy and transmit the power. For all New York? Oh, no, New York has enough water power, you see. The tide mills are enough for this whole region. 
They solved the tide mill problem, did they? Yes, there are innumerable mechanical advances, of course. You'll enjoy them. We were near enough now to see the city clearly. What a splendid waterfront! I cried. Why, this is glorious! It surely was. The wide shores swung away, glittering in the pure sunlight. Staten Island lay behind us, a vision of terraced loveliness. The Jersey shore shone clear, no foul pall of oil smoke overhanging. The Brooklyn banks were banks of palaces, and Manhattan itself towered royally before us, all bordered with broad granite piers. Marginal mile after mile of smooth-running granite embankment, quoted Nellie. Broad steps of marble descending for the people to enter the water. White-pillared piers. Look at the water, I cried suddenly. It's clear. Of course it's clear, she agreed laughingly. This is a civilized country, I tell you. I looked and looked. It was blue and bright in the distance. It was a soft, clear green beneath us. I saw a fish leap. So far I'm with you, anyhow, said I. That certainly is a big step and looks like a miracle. New York Harbor clean. How about customs? I asked as we drew in. Gone, clean forgotten, with a lot of other foolishness. The airship settled that. We couldn't plant custom houses in the air, you see, along ten thousand miles of coast and border. I was watching the shore. There were plenty of people about, but strangely gay of aspect and bright-colored in raiment. I could see amusement piers, numbers of them, some evidently used as gymnasia, in some there was dancing. Motor-cars of all descriptions ran swiftly and quietly about. Airships, large and small, floated off to the north and west, mostly. The water was freckled with pleasure-boats. I heard singing, and music. "'Some new holiday?' I ventured. "'Not at all,' said my sister. "'It is afternoon.' She watched me quizzically. "'It is afternoon.' she repeated. Let that sink in. It sank in slowly. Do you mean that no one works in the afternoon? No one, except those who don't work in the morning. Some kinds of work can't stop, of course, but most kinds can. I told you before, no one has to work more than two hours a day. Most people work four. Why? She saw my unbelieving stare. Because we like to. Also because we are ambitious she went on. I told you of the gain we've made in the civilized world. Not all of it is civilized. We are still missionarying, and while there is need of help anywhere on earth, most of us work overtime. Also it lays up public capital. We are planning some vast undertakings, and gives a wider margin for vacations. I was thinking in a hazy way of a world that was not tired, not driven, no nose on any grindstone of a people who had only to work two hours, and worked four. Yet there was every evidence of increased wealth. Suddenly Nellie gave a joyous little cry. "'Why, there's Owen!' she waved her veil. "'And there's Gerald and Hallie!' She fairly danced with pleasure. I could see a big, grayish man madly waving his hat down there, and two young folks hopping up and down in flourishing handkerchiefs, among many similarly excited. "'Oh, how good of him!' she cried. I never dreamed they'd be here. Nellie, said I sternly, you never told me you were married. Why should I? she asked innocently. You never asked me. I had not. I had seen that she signed her name Ellen Robertson, and I knew she was president of a college. How could I imagine her married? Married she evidently was, and even her long-lost brother was forgotten for a moment as the big man engulfed her in his grey overcoat, and the tall son and daughter added their arms to the group. But it was only a moment, and the big brotherly grasp of my new relation's hand, the cordial nephewly grip, and affectionate niecely kiss gave me a new and unexpected sense of the joys of homecoming. These were people, real people, as warm and kind and cheery as people ever were, and they greeted me with evident good will. It was Uncle John in no time, and Hallie in especial seized upon me as her own. "'I know Mother's got you all broken in by this time,' she said, "'and that you are prepared for all manner of amazing disclosures. But Mother never told us how handsome you are, Uncle John.' "'In vain is the net spread inside of any bird,' murmured young Gerald mischievously. "'Don't listen to him, Uncle. I am perfectly sincere,' she protested, leaning over to hug her mother again and turning back to me with a confiding smile. 
why should i doubt such evident good judgment said i and she slipped her hand in mine and squeezed it nelly sat there looking as proud and happy and matronly and motherly as anybody could and a great weight rolled off my heart some things were left of my old world anyway we talked gaily and excitedly on our way of immediate plans rolling smoothly along broad open streets a temporary conclusion was to stop at Halley's apartment for the time being, and I was conscious of a distinct sense of loss to think of my new-found niece being already married. "'How still it is!' I presently observed. "'Is that because it is afternoon, too?' "'Oh, no,' they assured me. "'We aren't as noisy as we used to be.' "'These children don't know anything about what we used to have to put up with,' said Owen. "'They never were in New York while it was screaming. You see, there are no horses.' all surface vehicles are rubber-tired, the minor delivery is pneumatic, and the freight all goes underneath, on those silent monorails. The great city spread about us, clean as a floor, quiet as a country town by comparison with what I remembered, yet full of the stir and murmur of moving crowds. Everyone we passed or met looked happy and prosperous, and even my inexperienced eye caught a difference in costuming. "'There's no masquerade on, is there?' I asked. "'Oh, no, we all wear what we please, that's all. Don't you like it?' Hallie asked. Generally there appeared the trim short skirt I had noticed as so appropriate on shipboard, here and there a sort of Florentine gown, long, richly damasked, sometimes a Greekish flow of drapery, the men mostly knickerbockered. I couldn't deny that it was pleasant to the eye, but it worried me a little none the less. "'There's no hurry, John,' said Nellie, always unobtrusively watching me some things you'll just have to get used to before i wholly accept this sudden new brother i presently suggested i'd like to know his name montrose owen montrose at your service he said bowing his fine head also gerald montrose and holly robertson dear dear i protested so it's come to that has it it's come to that and we still love each other nelly cheerfully agreed but it isn't final. There's a strong movement on foot to drop hereditary names altogether. I groaned. Oh, in the name of common humanity, don't tell me anything worse than you have now. Hallie's apartment was in a big building far uptown, overlooking the Hudson. I have to live in town nine months of the year, you see, Uncle, on account of my work, she explained rather apologetically. Hallie's an official, and awfully proud of it her brother whispered very loudly. "'Gerald's only a musician, and pretends to be proud of it,' she retorted, whereat he forcibly held and kissed her. I could see no very strong difference between this brother and sister, and others I had known, except perhaps that they were unusually affectionate. It was a big, handsome place. The front windows faced the great river, the rear ones were opened on a most unexpected scene of loveliness. A big, sheltered garden, every wall space surrounding it a joy to the eye rich masses of climbing vines a few trees a quiet fountain beautiful stone seats and winding walks flowers in profusion and birds singing we used to have only the song of the tomcat in my time have you taught the cat to lie down with the canary or killed him there are no animals kept in cities any more except the birds and they come and go mostly sparrows i suppose no the sparrow went with the horse owen replied and the mouse and the fly and the croton bug went with the kitchen i turned with a gesture of despair no homes left i didn't say home i said kitchen now brace up old man we still eat and better food than you ever dreamed of in your hungriest youth that's a long story nelly here suggested we mustn't crowd him Let's get washed and rested a bit, and have some of that food you're boasting of. They gave me a room with a river window, and I looked out at the broad current, changed only in its lovely clearness, and at the changeless palisades. Changeless? I started and seized the travelling glass still on the strap. The high cliffs reached away to the northward, still wooded, though sprinkled with buildings, but the more broken section opposite the city was a picture of startling beauty. The waterfront was green-parked, white-peered, rimmed with palaces, and the broken slopes terraced and garlanded in rich foliage. White cottages and larger buildings climbed and nestled along the sunny slopes as on the cliffs at Capri. It was a place one would go far to see. 
I dropped my eyes to the nearer shore. Again the park, the boulevard, the gracious outlines of fine architecture. It was beautiful, undeniably beautiful, but a strange world to me. I felt like one at a play. A plain, ordinary American landscape ought not to look like a theatre curtain. End of chapter 3 Moving the Mountain by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They called me to supper. Most of us have our heartiest meal in the middle of the day, my sister said. The average man, O oh victim of copious instruction, added my brother in law, does his work in the morning, the two hours that he has to, or the four that he usually puts in eight to twelve or nine to one that is the working day for everybody then home rest a bath maybe and then allow me to help you to some of our improvements i was hungry and this simple meal looked and smelled most appetizing there was in particular a large shining covered dish which being opened gave forth so savory a steam as fairly to make my mouth water a crisp and toothsome bread was by my plate a hot drink, which they laughingly refused to name, proved most agreeable. A suave, cool salad followed. Fruits, some of which were new to me, and most delicate little cakes closed the meal. They would not tell me a thing, only saying, Have some more. And I did. Not till I had eaten, with continuous delight, three helpings from the large dish, did I notice that it stood alone, so to speak. Nellie followed my eye with her usual prompt intelligence. Yes, she said, this is all. But we can send for other things in the twinkling of an eye. What would you like? I leaned back in my chair and looked at her reproachfully. I would like some of that salad. Not very much, please. And some of those Burbankian products yonder, and one particular brown little cake, if I can hold it. Nellie smiled demurely. Oh, she mildly remarked, I thought for the moment that our little supper seemed scant to you. I glared at her, retorting, Now I will not utter the grateful praises that were rising to my lips. I will even try to look critical and dissatisfied. And I did, but they all laughed. It's no manner of use, Uncle John, cried my pretty niece. We saw you eat it. It, indeed, I protested. What is this undeniably easy-to-take concoction you have stuffed me with? My esteemed new brother, Owen answered, we have been considering your case in conclave assembled, and we think it is wiser to feed you for a while and demand by all the rights of hospitality that you eat what is set before you and ask no questions for conscience' sake. When you begin to pine, to lose your appetite, to look wan and hollow-eyed, then we may reconsider. Meanwhile, we will tell you everything you want to know about food in general, and even some particulars. Present dishes always accepted. I will now produce information, began Hallie, my office being that of food inspector. Her main purpose in bringing you here, uncle, was to give you food and then talk about it, said Gerald solemnly. Hallie only made a face at him and went on. We have a magnificent system of production and distribution she explained, with a decreasing use of animal foods. "'Was this a vegetarian meal?' I asked in a hollow voice. "'Mostly. But you shall have meat when you want it. Better meat than you used to get, too.' "'Cold storage meat?' "'Oh, no, that's long since stopped. The way we manage about meat is this. A proper proportion of edible animals are raised under good conditions. Nice, healthy, happy beasts, killed so that they don't know it, and never kept beyond a certain time limit. You see, she paused, looking for the moment like her mother, the whole food business is changed. You don't realize. Go ahead and tell me. Tell me all. My life at present is that of Rollo, I perceive, and I am most complacent after this meal. Uncle, I rejoice in your discovery. I do indeed. You are an uncle after my own heart said Gerald. 
So my fair niece, looking like any other charming girl in a pretty evening frock, began to expound her specialty. Her mother begged to interrupt for the moment. "'Let me recall to him things as they were, which you hardly know, you happy child. Don't forget, John, that when we were young we did not know what good food was.' I started to protest, but she shook her finger at me. "'No, we didn't, my dear boy. We knew what we liked, as the people said at the picture show, but that did not make it good. Good in itself, or good for us. The world was ill-fed. Most of the food was below par, a good deal was injurious, some absolutely poison. People sold poison for food in 1910, don't forget that. You may remember the row that was beginning to be made about it. I admitted he recalling something of the sort, though it had not particularly interested me at the time. Well, that row went on, and gained in force. The women woke up. If you have said that once since we met, my dear sister, you've said it forty times. I wish you would make a parenthesis in these food discussions, and tell me how, when, and why the women woke up. Nellie looked a little dashed, and Owen laughed outright. You stand up for your rights, John, he said, rising and slapping me on the shoulder. Let's go in the other room and settle down for a chin. It's our fate. Hold him till he sees our housekeeping, said Gerald. I stood watching while they rapidly placed our dishes, which I now noticed were very few, in a neat square case which stood on a side table. Everything went in out of sight, paper napkins from the same receptacle wiped the shining table, and then a smooth running dumbwaiter took them from our sight. This is housework said Nellie mischievously. "'I refuse to be impressed. Come back to our muttons,' I insisted. "'You can tell me about your domestic sleight of hand in due season.' So we lounged in the large and pleasant parlour, the broad river before us, rimmed with starry lamps, sparkling everywhere with the lights of tiny pleasure-craft, and occasionally the blaze and wash of larger boats. I had a sense of pleasant well-being. I had eaten heartily, very heartily, yet was not oppressed. My new-found family pleased me well. The quiet room was beautiful in colour and proportion, and as my eyes wandered idly over it, I noted how few in number and how harmonious were its contents, giving a sense of peace and spaciousness. The air was sweet. I did not notice then, as I did later, that the whole city was sweet-aired now, at least by comparison with what cities used to be. From somewhere came the sound of soft music, grateful to the ear. I stretched myself luxuriously with, "'Now then, Nellie, let her go. The women woke up.' "'Some women were waking up tremendously before you left, John Robertson, only I dare say you never noticed it. They just kept on, faster and faster, till they all did. About all. There are some dodos left, even yet, but they don't count. Discredited grandmothers.' "'And being awake?' I gently suggested. "'And being awake, they—' She paused for an instant, seeking an expression, and Gerald's smooth bass voice put in, "'They saw their duty, and they did it.' "'Exactly,' his mother agreed with a proud, loving glance at him. "'That's just what they did. And in regard to the food business they recognized at last that it was their duty to feed the world— and that it was miserably done. So they took hold. "'Now, mother, this is my specialty,' Hallie interposed. "'When a person can only talk about one thing, why oppose them?' murmured Gerald. But she quite ignored him, and reopened her discussion. "'We—that is, most of the women and some of the men—began to seriously study the food question, both from a hygienic and an economic standpoint. I can't tell you that thirty years work in a minute, Uncle John, but here's the way we manage it now. We have learned very definitely what people ought not to eat, and it is not only a punishable, but a punished offence to sell improper foodstuffs. How are the people to know? I ventured. The people are not required to know everything. All the food is watched and tested by specialists. What goes into the market is good, all of it. By impeccable, angelic specialists like my niece? She shook her head at me. If they were not, the purchaser would spot them at once. 
You see, our food supply is not at the mercy of these millions of ignorant housewives any more. Food is bought and prepared by people who know how, and they have all the means and knowledge for expert tests. And if the purchaser, too, was humanly fallible? She cast a pitying glance on me, and her father took the floor for a moment. You see, John, in the old time the dealers were mostly poor, and sold cheap and bad stuff to make a little money. The buyers were mostly poor, and had to buy the cheap and nasty stuff. Even large manufacturers were under pressure, and had to cheat to make a profit, or thought they had to. Then, when we got to inspectors and such like, they were under the harrow too, and were by no means impeccable. Our big change is this. Nobody is poor now. I hear you say that, I answered, but I can't seem to get it through my head. Have you really divided all the property? John Robertson, I'm ashamed of you, cried Nellie. Even in 1910 people knew better than that, people who knew anything. That wasn't necessary, said Owen, nor desirable. What we have done is this. First, we have raised the productive capacity of the population. Second, we have secured their right to our natural resources. Third, we have learned to administer business without waste. The wealth of the world grows enormously. It is not what you would call equally distributed, but everyone has enough. There is no economic danger any more. There is economic peace. And economic freedom? asked I sharply. And economic freedom. People choose the work they like best and work freely, more than they have to. I pondered on this. Ah, but they have to. Labor is compulsory. Owen grinned. Yes, labor is compulsory. Always was. It is compulsory on everyone now. We used to have two sets who wouldn't work, paupers and the idle rich. No such classes left. All busy. But the freedom of the individual, I persisted. Come, come, brother. Society always played hob with the freedom of the individuals whenever it saw fit. It killed, imprisoned, fined. It had compulsory laws and regulations. It required people to wear clothes and furnished no clothes for them to wear. If society has a right to take human life, why has it not a right to improve it? No, my dear man, continued Owen. He was evidently launched on his specialty now. Society is not somebody else domineering over us. Society is us, taking care of ourselves. I took no exception to this, and he began again. Society in our young days was in a state of auto-intoxication. It generated its own poisons and absorbed them in peaceful, slow suicide. To think, that seems impossible now, to think of allowing anybody to sell bad food. That wasn't the only bad thing they sold, I suggested. No, unfortunately. Why, look here. Owen slid a glass panel in the wall and took out a book. That's clever, I remarked approvingly. Bookcase is built in. Yes, they are everywhere now, said Nellie. Books, a few of them, are common human necessities. Every home, every room almost, has these little dust-tight, insect-proof wall cases. Concrete construction has helped very much in all such matters. Owen had found his place, and now poured upon me a concentrated list of the adulterated materials deteriorating the world in that period so slightingly referred to as my day. I noticed with gratitude that Owen said, when we were young. You never were sure of getting anything pure, he said scornfully, no matter what you paid for it. How we submitted to such rank outrage for so long I cannot imagine. This was taken up very definitely some twenty years ago, by the women mostly. Aha! When the women woke up! I cried. Yes, just that. It is true that their being mostly mere housewives and seamstresses was a handicap in some ways, but it was a direct advantage in others. They were almost all consumers, you see, not producers. They were not so much influenced by considerations of the profits of the manufacturer as they were by the direct loss to their own pockets and health. Yes, he smiled reminiscently. There were some pretty warm years while this thing was thrashed out. One of the most successful lines of attack was the new food system, though. I will talk, 
cried Hallie. Here I've inveigled Uncle John up here, and then fed him to repletion, and have him completely at my mercy, and then you people butt in and do all the talking. Go it, little sister. You're dead right, agreed Gerald. You see, Uncle, it's one thing to restrain and prevent and punish, and another thing to substitute improvements. Kindergarten methods? I ventured. Yes, exactly. As women had learned this in handling children, they began to apply it to grown people. The same children, only a little older. Ever so many people had been talking and writing about this food business, and finally some of them got together and really started it. One of those cooperative schemes? I was beginning, but the women looked at me with such pity and contempt that I promptly withdrew the suggestion. Not much, said Nellie disdainfully. Of course, those cooperative schemes were a natural result of the growing difficulties in our old methods, but they were on utterly wrong lines. No, sir, the new food business was a real business, and a very successful one. The first company began about 1912 or 13, I think. Just some women with a real business sense and enough capital. They wisely concluded that a block of apartments was the natural field for their services, and that professional women were their natural patrons. The unprofessional women, or professional wives, as you might call them, had only their house wifery to preserve their self-respect, you see, put in Owen. If they didn't do housekeeping for a living, what, in the name of decency, did they do? This was called the Home Service Company, said Hallie. I will talk, mother. They built some unusually attractive apartments planned by women to please women. This block was one of the finest designs of their architects, women too, by the way who had waked up, murmured Gerald unnoticed. It was frankly advertised as specially designed for professional women. They looked at it, liked it, and moved it. Teachers, largely doctors, lawyers, dressmakers, women who worked. Sort of a nunnery? I asked. My dear brother, do you imagine that all working women were orphan spinsters even in your day? cried Nellie. The self-supporting women of that time generally had other people to support, too. Lots of them were married. Many were widows with children. Even the single ones had brothers and sisters to take care of. They rushed in, anyhow, said Hallie. The place was beautiful and built for enjoyment. There was a nice garden in the middle. Like this one here, I interrupted. This is a charming patio. How do they make space for it? New York blocks were not divinely ordained, Owen replied. It occurred to the citizens at last that they could bisect those two hundred by eight hundred foot oblongs, and they did. Wide, tree-shaded, pleasant ways run between the old avenues, and the blocks remaining are practically squares. "'You noticed the irregular border of grass and shrubbery as we came up, didn't you, Uncle?' asked Gerald. "'We forgot to speak about it, because we are used to it.' I did recall now that our ride had been not through monotonous stone-faced right-angled ravines, but along the pleasant fronts of gracious varying buildings, whose skyline was a pleasure and street-line bordered greenly. "'You didn't live here and don't remember, maybe,' Owen remarked. "'But the regular thing uptown was one of those lean, long blocks, flat-faced and solid, built to the sidewalk's edge. If it was a line of private houses, they were bordered with gloomy little stone-paved areas, and ornamented with ash-cans and garbage-pails. If the avenue end was faced with tall apartments, their lower margin was infested with a row of little shops—meat, fish, vegetable, fruit—with all their litter and refuse and flies, and constant traffic. Now a residence block is a thing of beauty on all sides. The really necessary shops are maintained, but planned for in the building, and made beautiful. Those fly-tainted meat markets no longer exist. "'I will talk,' said Hallie, so plaintively that we all laughed and let her. The first one I was telling you about was very charming and attractive. There were arrangements on the top floor for nurseries and child gardens, and the roof was for children all day. Evenings the grown-ups had it. Great care was taken by the management at letting this part to the best professionals in child culture. There were big rooms, too, for meetings and parties, places for billiards and bowling and swimming. It was planned for real human enjoyment, like a summer hotel. "'But I thought you said this place was for women,' I incautiously ventured. "'Oh, Uncle John, 
and has it never occurred to you that women like to amuse themselves or that professional women have men relatives and men friends there were plenty of men in the building and plenty more to visit it they were shown how nice it was you see but the chief card was the food and the service this company engaged at high wages first-class houseworkers and the residents paid for them by the hour and they had a food service which was beyond the dreams of of homes or boarding-houses your professional women must have been millionaires i mildly suggested you think so because you do not understand the food business uncle john nobody did in those days we were so used to the criminal waste of individual housekeeping with its pitifully low standards and to monotonous low-grade restaurant meals with their waste and extortion that it never occurred to us to estimate the amount of profit there really was in the business these far-seeing women were pioneers but not for long dozens are claiming first place now just as the early women's clubs used to they established in that block a meal service that was a wonder for excellence and for cheapness too and people began to learn i was impressed but not convinced and she saw it look here uncle john i hate to use figures on a helpless listener but you drive me to it then she reached for the bookcase and produced her evidence sparingly but with effect she showed me that the difference between the expense of hiring separate service and the same number of people patronizing a service company was sufficient to reduce expenses to the patrons and leave a handsome payment for the company owen looked on interpreting to my ignorance you never kept house old man he said nor thought much about it i expect but you can figure this out for yourself easily enough here were a hundred families equal to say five hundred persons they hired a hundred cooks of course paid them something like six dollars a week call it five on an average there's five hundred dollars a week just for cooks twenty six thousand dollars a year now as a matter of fact our learned daughter tells us this ten cooks are plenty for five hundred persons at the same price would cost thirteen hundred a year ten are plenty and to spare said hallie but we pay them handsomely one chef at three thousand the next two best at two thousand each four thousand two at one thousand apiece two thousand five at eight hundred four thousand that's thirteen thousand dollars half what we paid before and the difference in service between a kitchen maid and a scientific artist fifty per cent saved on wages and five hundred per cent added to skill owen continued and you can go right on and add ninety per cent saving in fuel ninety per cent in plant and fifty per cent in utensils and how much is it hallie in materials hallie looked very important even when they first started when food was shamefully expensive and required all manner of tests and examinations the saving was all of sixty per cent now it is fully eighty per cent that makes a good deal all told uncle john gerald quietly remarked handing me a bit of paper you see it does leave a margin of profit i looked rather helplessly at the figures also at hallie it is a shame uncle to hurry you so but the sooner you get these little matters clear in your head the better we have these great food furnishing companies now all over the country and they have market gardens and dairies and so on of their own there is a food bureau in every city and a national food bureau with international relations the best scientific knowledge is used to study food values to improve old materials and develop new ones there's a tremendous gain but do the people swallow things as directed by the government i protested is there no chance to go and buy what you want to eat when you want it they rose to their feet with one accord gerald seized me by the hand come on uncle he cried now is as good a time as any you shall see our food department come to scoff and remain to pray if you like the elevator took us down and i was led unresistingly among their shining modernities here's the source of supply said owen showing where the basement supply room connected with a clean airy subway under the glass paved sidewalk ice we make drinking water we distill fuel is wired to us but the foodstuffs are brought this way come down early enough and you would find these arteries of the city flowing steadily with milk and honey put in gerald with the milk train the meat train the vegetable train and so on ordered beforehand i asked ordered beforehand 
Up to midnight you may send down word as to the kind of mushrooms you prefer, and no extra charge. During the day you can still order, but there's a trifle more expense. Not much. But most of us are more than content to have our managers cater for us. From the home outfit you may choose at any time. There are lists upstairs, and here is the array. There were but few officials in this part of the great establishment at this hour, but we were politely shown about by a scholarly-looking man in white linen, who had been reading as we entered. They took me between rows of glass cases, standing as books do in the library, and showed me the day's baking, the year's preserves, the fragrant, colourful shells of such fruit and vegetables as were not fresh picked from day to day. "'We don't get today's strawberries till the local ones are ripe,' Gerald told us. "'These are yesterday's, and pretty good yet.' "'Excuse me, but these have just come in,' said the white linen person. "'This morning's picking, from Maryland.' I tasted them with warm approval. There was a fascinating display of cakes and cookies, some old favourites, some of a new but attractive aspect, and in glass-doored separate ice-chambers, meats, fish, milk, and butter. "'Can people come in here and get what they want, though?' I inquired triumphantly. "'They can, and occasionally they do. But what it will take you some time to realise, John,' my sister explained, "'is the different attitude of people toward their food. We are not only well fed, sufficiently fed, but so wisely fed that we seldom think of wanting anything further. When we do, we can order from upstairs, come down to the eating-room and order, send to the big depots if it is some rare thing, or even come in like this. To the regular purchasers it is practically free. And how if you are a stranger, a man in the street? In every city in our land you may go into any eating-house and find food as good and cheap as this, said Halley triumphantly. End of chapter 4「Of Moving the Mountain – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett – Moving the Mountain – by Charlotte Perkins Gilman Preface One of the most distinctive features of the human mind is to forecast better things. We look before and after, and pine for what is not. This natural tendency to hope, desire, foresee, and then, if possible, obtain, has been largely diverted from human usefulness since our goal was placed after death, in heaven. With all our hope in another world, we have largely lost hope of this one. Some minds, still keen in the perception of better human possibilities, have tried to write out their vision and give it to the world. From Plato's ideal republic to Wells's day of the comet, we have had many utopias set before us, best known of which are that of Sir Thomas More and the great modern instance, looking backward. All these have one or two distinctive features, an element of extreme remoteness, or the introduction of some mysterious outside force. Moving the mountain is a short-distance utopia, a baby utopia, a little one that can grow. It involves no other change than a change of mind, the mere awakening of people, especially the women, to existing possibilities. It indicates what people might do, real people now living, in thirty years, if they would. One man, truly aroused and redirecting his energies, can change his whole life in thirty years. So can the world. CHAPTER One. On a grey, cold, soggy Tibetan plateau stood glaring at one another two white people, a man and a woman. With the first a group of peasants, with the second the guides and carriers of a well-equipped exploring party. The man wore the dress of a peasant, but around him was a leather belt, old, worn, battered, but a recognizable belt of no Asiatic pattern and showing a heavy buckle made in twisted initials. 
the woman's eye had caught the sunlight on this buckle before she saw that the heavily bearded face under the hood was white. She pressed forward to look at it. "'Where did you get that belt?' she cried, turning for the interpreter to urge her question. The man had caught her voice, her words. He threw back his hood and looked at her, with a strange blank look, as of one listening to something far away. "'John!' she cried. "'John! My brother!' He lifted a groping hand to his head, made a confused noise that ended in almost a shout of, "'Nellie!' reeled and fell backward. When one loses his mind, as it were, for thirty years, and finds it again, when one wakes up, comes to life, recognizes oneself an American citizen twenty-five years old. No, this is what I find it so hard to realize. I am not twenty-five. I am fifty-five. Well, as I was saying, when one comes to life again like this, and has to renew acquaintance with one's own mind, in a sudden swarming rush of hurrying memories, that is a good deal of pressure for a brain so long unused. But when, on top of that, one is pushed headlong into a world immeasurably different from the world one has left at twenty-five, a topsy-turvy world, wherein all one's most cherished ideals are found to be reversed, rearranged, or utterly gone, where strange new facts are accompanied by strange new thoughts and strange new feelings, the pressure becomes terrific. Nellie has suggested that I write it all down, and I think for once she is right. I disagree with her on so many points that I am glad to recognize the wisdom of this idea. It will certainly be a useful process in my re-education, and relieve the mental tension. So, to begin with my first life being now in my third. I am the only son of a Methodist minister of South Carolina. My mother was a Yankee. She died after my sister Ellen was born, when I was seven years old. My father educated me well. I was sent to a small southern college, and showed such a talent for philology that I specialized in ancient languages, and, after some teaching and the taking of various degrees, I had a wonderful opportunity to join an expedition into India and Tibet. I was eager for a sight of those venerable races, those hoary scriptures, those time-honoured customs. We were travelling through the Himalayas, and the last thing I remember was a night camp and a six-months-old newspaper from home. We had rejoicingly obtained it from a party we met in the pass. It was read and re-read by all of us, even the advertisements even the editorials, and in one of these I learned that Mrs. Eddy had been dead some time, and that another religion had burst forth, and was sweeping the country, madly taken up by the women. That was my last news item. I suppose it was this reading, and the discussions we had, that made me walk in my sleep that night. That is the only explanation I can give. I know I lay down just as I was, and that's all I know until Nelly found me. The party reported me lost. They searched for days, made what inquiry they could. No faintest clue was ever found. Himalayan precipices are very tall, and very sudden. My sister Nelly was travelling in Tibet and found me, with a party of peasants. She gathered what she could from them, through interpreters. It seems that I fell among those people, literally bruised, stunned, broken, but not dead. Some merciful, or shall I say unmerciful, trees had softened the fall and let me down easy, comparatively speaking. They were good people, Buddhists. They mended my bones and cared for me, and it appears made me quite a chief man in course of time in their tiny village. But their little valley was so remote and unknown, so out of touch with any and everything, that no tale of this dumb white man ever reached western ears. I was dumb until I learned their language, was as a child of a day, they said, knew absolutely nothing. They taught me what they knew. I suppose I turned a prayer mill. I suppose I was married. Nellie didn't ask that, and they never mentioned such a detail. 
furthermore they gave so dim an account of where the place was that we don't know now should have to locate that night's encampment and then look for a precipice and go down it with ropes as i have no longer any interest in those venerable races and time-honoured customs i think we will not do this well she found me and something happened she says i knew her shouted nelly and fell down fell on a stone too and hit my head so hard they thought i was dead this time for sure but when i came to i came all the way back to where i was thirty years ago and as for those thirty years i do not remember one day of them nor do i wish to i have those filthy tibetan clothes sterilized and packed away but i never want to look at them i am back in the real world back where i was at twenty-five but now i am fifty-five now about nelly i must go slowly and get this thing straightened out for good and all my little sister i was always fond of her and she adored me she looked up to me naturally believed everything i told her minded me like a little dog when she was a child and as she grew into girlhood i had a strong restraining influence upon her she wanted to be educated to go to college but father wouldn't hear of it of course and i backed him up if there is anything on earth i always hated and despised it is a strong-minded woman that is it was i certainly cannot hate and despise my sister nelly now it appears that soon after my departure from this life father died very suddenly nelly inherited the farm and the farm turned out to be a mine and the mine turned out to be worth a good deal of money so that poor child having no natural guardian or protector just set to work for herself went to college to her heart's content to a foreign university too she studied medicine practiced a while then was offered a chair in a college and took it then i hate to write it but she is now president of a college a co-educational college don't you mean dean i asked her no she said there is a dean of the girls building but i am the president my little sister the worst of it is that my little sister is now forty-eight and i to all intents and purposes am twenty-five she is twenty-three years older than i am she has had thirty years of world life which i have missed entirely and this thirty years i begin to gather has covered more changes than in an ordinary century or two it is lucky about that mine at least i shall not have to worry about money i said to her when she told me about our increased fortune she gave one of those queer little smiles as if she had something up her sleeve and said no you won't have to worry in the least about money having all that medical skill of hers in the background she took excellent care of me up there on those dreary plains and hills brought me back to the coast by easy stages and home on one of those new steamers but i mustn't stop to describe the details of every new thing i notice i have sense enough myself even if i'm not a doctor to use my mind gradually not to swallow too fast as it were nelly is a little inclined to manage me i don't know as i blame her i do feel like a child sometimes it is so humiliating not to know little common things such as everybody else knows airships i expected of course they had started before i left they are common enough all sizes but water is still the cheaper route as well as slower nelly said she didn't want me to get home too quick she wanted time to explain things so we spent long quiet hours in our steamer chairs talking things over it's no use asking about the family there is only a flock of young cousins and once removed now the aunts and uncles are mostly gone uncle jake is left nelly grins wickedly when she mentions him if things get too hard on you john you can go down to uncle jake's and rest up he and aunt dorcas haven't moved an inch they fairly barricade their minds against a new idea and he ploughs and she cooks up on that little mountain farm just as they always did people go to see them why shouldn't they i asked and she smiled that queer little smile again i mean they go to see them as if they were the pyramids 
i see said i i might as well prepare for some preposterous nightmare of a world like what was that book of wells the sleeper awakened oh yes i remember that book she answered and a lot of others people were always guessing about things as they might be weren't they but what never struck any of them was that people themselves could change no i agreed you can't alter human nature nelly laughed laughed out loud then she squeezed my hand and patted it you dear she said you precious old long-lost brother when you get too utterly upset i'll wear my hair down put on a short dress and let you boss me a while just to keep your spirits up that was just the phrase wasn't it you can't alter human nature and she laughed again there is something queer about nelly very queer it is not only that she is different from my little sister that's natural but she is different from any woman of forty-eight i ever saw from any woman of any age i ever saw in the first place she doesn't look old not at all women of forty in our region were old women and nelly's near fifty then she isn't what shall i call it dependent not the least in the world as soon as i became really conscious and strong enough to be of any use and began to offer her those little services and attentions due to a woman i noticed this difference she is brisk firm assured not unpleasantly so i don't mean a thing of that sort but somehow like almost like a man no i certainly don't mean that she is not in the least mannish nor in the least self-assertive but she takes things so easily as if she owned them i suppose it will be some time before my head is absolutely clear and strong as it used to be i tire rather easily nelly is very reassuring about it she says it will take about a year to re-establish connections and renew mental processes she advises me to read and talk only a little every day to sleep all i can and not to worry you'll be all right soon my dear she says and plenty of life before you you seem to have led a very healthy outdoor life you're really well and strong and as good-looking as ever at least she hasn't forgotten that woman's chief duty is to please and the world is a much better place to live in than it was she assured me things will surprise you of course things i have gotten used to and shall forget to tell you about but the changes are all good ones and you'll soon get acclimated you're young yet that's where nelly slips up she cannot help having me in mind as the brave young brother she knew she forgets that i am an old man now finally i told her that no john robertson said she that's where you are utterly wrong of course you don't know what we're doing about age how differently we feel as a matter of physiology we find that about one hundred and fifty ought to be our natural limit and that with proper conditions we can easily get to be a hundred now ever so many do i don't want to be a hundred i protested i saw a man of ninety-eight once and never want to be one it's not like that now she said i mean we live to be a hundred and enjoy life still keep our faculties as they used to put it why the ship's doctor here is eighty-seven this surprised me a good deal i had talked a little with this man and had thought him about sixty then a man of a hundred according to your story would look like 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 grandpa eli she offered i remembered my mother's father a tall straight hale old man of seventy-five he had a clear eye a firm step a rosy color in his face well that wasn't so bad a prospect i consent to be a hundred on those terms i told her she talked to me a good bit in small daily doses of the more general changes in the world showed me new maps even let me read a little in the current magazines i suppose you have a million of these now i said there were thousands when i left no she answered there are fewer i believe but much better i turned over the one in my hand it was pleasantly light and thin it opened easily the paper and presswork were of the best the price was twenty-five cents is this a cheap one at a higher price or have the best ones come down it's a cheap one 
she told me, if you mean by that a popular one, and it's cheap enough. They have all of a million subscribers. And what's the difference beyond the paper and print? I asked. The pictures are good. I looked through again. Yes, very good, much improved. But I don't see anything phenomenal, unless it is the absence of advertisements. Nellie took it out of my hand and ran it over. Just read some of that, she said. Read this story, and this article, and that. So I sat reading in the sunny silence, the gulls wheeling and dipping just as they used to, and the wide purple ocean just as changeable, and change less, as ever. One of the articles was on an extension of municipal service, and involved so much comment on preceding steps that I found it most enlightening. The other was a recent suggestion in educational psychology, and this too carried a retrospect of recent progress which gave me food for thought. The story was a clever one. I found it really amusing, and only on a second reading did I find what it was that gave the queer flavour to it. It was a story about women, two women who were in business partnership, with their adventures singly and together. I looked through it carefully. They were not even girls, they were not handsome, they were not in process of being married. In fact, it was not once mentioned whether they were married or not, ever had been or ever wanted to be. Yet I had found it amusing. I laid the magazine on my rug-bound knees and meditated. A queer sick feeling came over me, mental, not physical. I looked through the magazine again. It was not what I should have called a woman's magazine, yet the editor was a woman, most of the contributors were women, and in all the subject matter I began to detect allusions and references of tremendous import. Presently Nellie came to see how I was getting on. I saw her approaching, a firm, brisk figure, well and becomingly dressed, with a tailored trimness and convenience, far indeed from the slim, graceful, yielding girl I had once been so proud to protect and teach. "'How soon do we get in, Lady Manager?' I asked her. "'Day after to-morrow.' she answered back promptly, not a word about going to see or asking any one. "'Well, ma'am, I want you to sit down here and tell me things right now. What am I to expect? Are there no men left in America?' She laughed gaily. "'No men! Why, bless you, there are as many men as there are women, and a few more, I believe. Not such an overplus as there used to be, but some to spare still. We had a million and a half extra in your day, you know. I'm glad to learn we're allowed to live, said I. Now tell me the worst. Are the men doing all the housework? You call that the worst, do you? inquired Nellie, cocking her head to one side and looking at me affectionately, and yet quizzically. Well, I guess it was. Pretty near the worst. No, dear, men are doing just as many kinds of business as they ever were. I heaved a sigh of relief and chucked my magazine under the chair. I'd begun to think there weren't any men left, and they still wear trousers, don't they? She laughed outright. Oh, yes, they wear just as many trousers as they did before. And what do the women wear? I demanded suspiciously. Whatever kind of clothing their work demands, she answered. Their work? What kind of work do they do? All kinds. Anything they like. I groaned and shut my eyes. I could see the world as I left it with only a small proportion of malcontents and a large majority of contented and happy homes, and then I saw this awful place I was coming to, with strange masculine women and subdued men. How does it happen that there aren't any on this ship? I inquired. Any what? asked Nellie. Any of these new women? Why, there are. They're all new, except Mrs. Talbot. She's older than I am, and rather reactionary. This Mrs. Talbot was a stiff, pious, narrow-minded old lady, and I had liked her the least of any on board. Do you mean to tell me that pretty Mrs. Exeter is one of this new kind? Mrs. Exeter owns and manages a large store, if that is what you mean. And those pretty Borden girls? They do house decorating, have been abroad on business. And Mrs. Green, and Miss Sandwich? 
one of them is a hat designer one a teacher this is toward the end of vacation and they're all coming home you see and miss elwell miss elwell was quite the prettiest woman on board and seemed to have plenty of attention just like the girls i remembered miss elwell is a civil engineer said my sister it's horrid i said it's perfectly horrid and aren't there any women left there's aunt dorcas said nelly mischievously and cousin drusilla you remember drusilla end of chapter one